Well, I'd like to spend my 12 minutes actually talking about some of my experiences with crowdsource science, disease progression, and ALS. And this is joint work with my wife, uh, Lily Fang. So first, what is ALS? Well, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease, is a fatal neurodegenerative disease um, with few known correlates and no known, uh, no known cures. Uh, most who have this disease are, die within three to five years of diagnosis, but that's not always the case. Um, here on the left, you'll see Lou Gehrig, um, who actually di died within two years of being diagnosed with ALS. On the right-hand side, you also see Stephen Hawking, who's lived with the disease for over 50 years. So we consider these to be um, prototypical, fast, and slow progressors in the ALS terminology. In 2004, a 29-year-old Harvard business student, Avi Kramer, was diagnosed with ALS, and the story goes that he locked himself into his room for a few days, depressed, and then he emerged uh, determined to find a cure. So in 2006, he founded a, an ALS nonprofit, Prize for Life, with the goal of accelerating the development of treatment for ALS. In 2012, Prize for Life launched the competition. It was a $50,000 data science competition, and the goal was to predict the rate of disease progression in ALS. The question was, can we actually distinguish ahead of time these fast progressors from the slow progressors? So what do, what do I mean about, by ALS progression exactly? Well, there is a common rating scale in ALS called the ALS Functional Rating Scale, ALS-FRS. It's a measure of patient functionality. It ranges from 0 to 40, and it's based on a series of questions that are asked. These are questions regarding everyday activity, like breathing, walking, dressing, writing. If you receive an activity score of 4 in a category, that's considered to be normal, and a score of 0 means that you have complete inability in that category. So a slow progressor in ALS terminology will lose 0 to 3 points in a year, and a fast progressor can lose upwards of 20 points in a year. OK, so that's what ALS progression is. That's how we measure it. Why would we care about predicting it? Well, one reason is that we'd like to help clinicians. So we'd like to have more accurate prognoses based on the attributes that we know about a patient. And we'd also like to identify predictive patient characteristics. For instance, which lab tests are actually useful for determining whether or not um, you're going to live longer. In addition to this, we'd actually like to do a better job at stratifying clinical trial patients. So this, we get less variability if we can predict um, progression well. That means fewer patients are needed overall, your clinical trial is less expensive, and your clinical trial is also more interpretable. Now, the Prize for Life organization estimated that a 20% reduction in patients needed could be, could be accomplished with the uh, algorithm that we produced. And that's, that's, that, that amounts to a lot of money when you think about this last 1,000 patient clinical trial, which cost $100 million. OK, so that's the why and the what. Um, how do we actually go about doing this? How do we actually predict ALS progression? Well, in this case, we use a subset of the PROACT database. That's the Pooled Resource Open Access ALS Clinical Trials database. It has 8,500 de-identified patient records. This is the largest ALS database ever compiled. It includes demographics, medical history, family history, um, various functional measures like the ALS functional rating score, lung capacity, various vital signs, and also a variety of lab tests that were conducted on patients over time. And this data set was released to the public in December of 2012. And around that data set, Prize for Life lost, launched a competition. So this is the ALS prediction prize. In that uh, competition, you were given training data from 918 patients. For each of those patients, you had 12 months of clinical trial measurements. So you have the demographics, but also the ALS FRS score over time, various vital statistics over time, and lab tests over time. And these time series were measured at roughly month monthly intervals, but they were uneven. So different patients showed up at different times, and the time series can't actually be aligned to one another. On top of that, you have 279 test patients, and for these patients, you'd like to make a prediction. You observe the first three months of their clinical trial data, and you'd like to predict how rapidly is ALS progressing over the next nine months. How rapidly will it progress over the next nine months? So the challenge is, given three months of data, predict this ALS progression over nine months. And the measure of progression is the change, the slope, in this ALS functional rating score over time. 
Now, this contest was evaluated through the Inocentive Plies platform. This is a um, this is a website that actually produces data science competitions and other sorts of science competitions. Contestants had to upload their, upload their code, their predictive code, to a server. The code had to be written in R, and it had to run in fewer than six hours. Those were the constraints. And then the leaderboard would display your error on the test set. Right? So you don't actually observe the last nine months of the clinical trial data for these test patients, and the leaderboard will display how well you predicted that um, ALS progression. And they limited the number of submissions to 100 to control overfitting, they said. The error metric here being reported on this leaderboard is root mean squared deviation. OK, so in the last month of this competition, the test set was actually released to all of the uh, contestants. So now you have your original 918 training patients. You have an additional 279 test patients on which you can now train. You have 12 months for all of these patients. And the final evaluation of the contest, this is what allowed them to award the prize money, was based on yet another set of patients. They call this the validation patients. There are 625 of those. They're never before seen by any contestant. You had no feedback on them. And this is to actually test your ability, the ability of your algorithm to generalize to new patients as it would have to in a real setting. OK, so that's all the setup of the competition. What did we actually do? Uh, well, our approach had two, two components. The first was featureization. The goal here was to have a compact numeric representation of each patient that we could then feed into a machine learning method. So these features were serving as covariates in our regression model. We expected that most of the features we extracted would be irrelevant for our prediction, but we were hoping that we could choose a model that would have um, powerful model selection and be robust to irrelevant features. So altogether, we extracted 49 static features based on demographics like age and race and sex, um, also based on ALS history, where was the onset of your disease, family history, who else in your family had ALS. And then we, in, in addition to that, extracted another 435 features based on the time series data. So re remember that we have these repeated measurements of functional rating and vital statistics and lab tests over time. We found various summary statistics from each time series, threw them all into a very large feature vector, and then passed them into the next phase of our method, which was Bayesian ad additive regression trees. So this is a method, a prediction method by Chipman, George, and McCulloch. It forms its prediction rule as a sum of simple decision trees. Simple me here means that each tree only depends on a few features. So as you see in this example, one tree might look at how many days has it been since you were first diagnosed with ALS, with ALS and make a prediction of, for, your, for your progression based on that feature. Another tree will look at what was the, what was the uh, past rate of progression over time and use that to make a prediction. All the predictions are added together, and this forms your final predictive rule. And this is very similar to various non-Bayesian ensemble methods like dis uh, boosted decision trees or random forests. So this combination, this featureization combination, and BART, Bayesian Additive Regression Tree Predictive Model, actually placed first in the competition. And we were interested in how other models would have performed given the same feature set that we extracted. So we did this post hoc evaluation that you see here. Um, we ran lasso regression on the same feature set, random forests, boosted trees, and BART. The test set is what was used to populate the leaderboard. The validation set is what mattered for the competition. Um, what you can see is that the final validation set performance was pretty comparable across these different ensemble decision tree methods. We could have used random forests or boosted trees in this case and still have come out ahead. Um, other competitors did make use of random forests. Um, the second and third place teams did. Um, their error was a bit higher, and this led us to conclude that, in fact, futurization was the main differentiator amongst competitors in the competition. So what, is this, what does this say about the future? Well, for one, we have this competition that was run. Many different contestants were um, producing algorithms, producing models that were quite powerful and predictive. What does that teach us about ALS? Well, four solvers identified uric acid as predictive of progression in this competition. And there actually was, there's some literature to support that perhaps there is some association there. So there's, there's this question of whether we can find new biomarkers by looking at the features that were most important amongst various competitors' solutions. Um, here's a list of new predictors that were supported by three or more solvers in the competition. Pulse, blood pressure, create um, mon monocytes. These are all represent new lines of inquiry for ALS that hadn't been explored in the past. 
The second major question is whether this can lead to clinical adoption. We had this predictive challenge, but I would say the grand challenge is actually introducing these algorithms to clinicians, trial managers, pharmaceutical companies, and seeing whether that leads to more accurate prognoses, as I mentioned, whether that leads to less expensive clinical trials, and new incentives for ALS drug development. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you.